what happens when the recruiting cost goes to zero. So we'll study that, we'll see how it affects demand and supply, and then we'll see how we can represent that on the uh, labor market diagram. So what, we're going to look at what happens when the recruiting cost Uh, goes to zero. Uh, so what happens to the labor supply? Nothing happens. We know that the labor supply is unaffected. The labor supply stays the same and uh, so uh, that's going to be completely fine. Um, what happens to the labor demand? So the labor demand, we know that it involves always a, a tau, the recruiter-producer ratio, and that depends on R, the recruiting cost. Um, so uh, I should have said labor supply just for references in case we want to know labor supply will remain F of theta. divided by S plus F of theta times H, okay? So labor demand will change. Uh, so what's the expression for the labor demand? So in the case of a concave production function with rigid wave, that's something that we had derived before. So the labor demand is going to depend on theta and um, on R. So, we have 1 over 1 minus alpha. In the num uh, numerator, we have alpha. Then we have A gamma. Here we have omega that comes, sorry. Uh, we have m one minus gamma. Here we have omega that comes from the expression for the wage. And then we have one plus tau of theta alpha. Okay, so that just comes from the expression for the labor demand that we had seen. So, uh, so the key thing is that here the recruiter-producer ratio tau of theta. We know that it's equal to uh, R, the routine cost, times S, the job separation rate, divided by Q of theta minus R times S. So from this, we infer that 1 plus tau of theta is going to be Q of theta divided by Q of theta minus R times S. Okay, but so from this we see that for any theta, what's going to happen is that, um, so for any finite theta, Q of theta is going to be uh, finite, I mean, you know, as long as of course, we know that Q of theta goes to infinity when theta goes to zero, but so for any theta that's positive and finite, Q of theta is going to be finite. And as a result, 1 plus tau of theta, when R goes to zero, 1 plus tau of theta is just going to converge to uh, 1, right? So for any theta in zero infinity, but excluding the two bounds, what we can see is that if we fix the theta, the limit of 1 plus tau of theta when r goes to 0 it's going to be so when you take r to 0 rs goes to 0 and as a result um, as a result 1 plus tau of theta becomes q of theta over q of theta and that's just equal to 1 
That's the key thing is that when the reporting cost goes to zero, one plus tau of theta is just going to be equal to one. So another way to say it is that tau of theta goes to zero, so the recruiter-producer ratio goes to zero. Yet another way of saying it is that there are just no recruiters in your firm when the recruiting cost goes to zero. Basically, if you don't need any recruiters, the recruiting cost goes to zero, you don't need any recruiters to take care of your vacancies, so you're not going to have any recruiters in your firm. Okay? So what we showed is that tau of theta goes to zero when r goes to zero. Another way what we've seen is that uh, the number of recruiters goes to zero when r goes to zero, which, which makes sense. Okay? So great. So what happens to our demand when r goes to zero? The labor demand, the theta is going to be equal to what? Well, we can just take what we have, but replace one plus tau of theta by one. So for any theta, you know, we can just take a pointwise limit. For any theta, we can take the limit when r goes to zero. Uh, and so that gives us the labor demand. So the labor demand is just going to be alpha a1 minus gamma. So this I keep that we had. Then we have an omega. Then we had a 1 plus tau of theta here alpha, but that's just going to be 1, so that vanishes. Let me just keep that like this. 1 over 1 minus alpha. And so what do we see here? So I have an expression for the labor demand, but what you can see is that this labor demand doesn't depend on theta anymore. And indeed, the only reason why the labor demand, why, uh, so basically how many workers, firms want to hire depends on tightness is because um, tightness determines how many recruiter firms need to have. So when the tightness is very high on the labor market, meaning there's a lot of competition for unemployed workers. It's difficult, it takes time to fill vacancies, and therefore firms need to have a lot of recruiters. And recruiters, you have to pay them, they don't produce anything. So it makes, uh, you know, it, it makes hiring new workers less profitable, just because you need to, out of these workers you hire, a good share of them are going to be recruiters. So the whole operation is less profitable, so firms want fewer workers. Okay? So that's why the labor demand is decreasing in tightness. It's through the recruiting process, because of the recruiting process. But now, if the recruiter recruiting cost is zero, the recruiter producer ratio is always zero, so there's no reason that tightness matters to firms. You know, firms never have recruiters, they don't care about what the tightness is. And so that's why we can see that the labor demand does not depend on tightness okay and um, so what does that mean uh, in the labor uh, market diagram it means that the labor demand curve is going to be not horizontal like in uh, the standard and rigid white model but it's going to be vertical Is going to be vertical in our uh, labor market diagram. Okay. So, um, so what we learn from that is that the labor demand, you know, it doesn't depend on theta. So what that means is that the labor demand is going to by itself determine the level of employment in the economy. So you remember. In the standard model and the rigid wage model, the labor demand was horizontal, so it was determining tightness by itself. Then employment was read off of the labor supply. Here it's the opposite. The labor demand is vertical, so it determines employment by itself. And then the tightness is going to be read off of the labor supply curve. 
okay? Um, so labor demand determines employment. And of course, if you determine employment, you're also going to determine in the background output uh, by itself. And this, in macroeconomics, sometimes we call that a demand determined economy. Okay, so let me illustrate that on the labor market diagram. So here's what we have now. We have our y-axis, x-axis, then we have the size of the labor force. So here we have theta on the y-axis, employment on the x-axis, the labor force here. Here we have a zero. So labor supply, nothing has changed, it's still the same curve as before. Uh, but what has changed is the labor demand. So we've seen that the labor demand is now a vertical, so something like this. Okay. And so, uh, so how do we find the equilibrium here? Well, very easy. Equilibrium level of, of uh, employment is just given by the labor demand. You can just read it here. This is our level of employment. Now, the equilibrium on the market is still given by the intersection of demand and supply. Here, this is our equilibrium. And then what is the level of tightness? Well, you can read it off this intersection here. So you still have a tightness in equilibrium, it's given by here. What is the level of uh, unemployment in this economy? Well, it's just the gap between uh, the labor demand and the size of the labor force. Okay. Uh, And so now, so the question that, uh, that we have to ask is, do we, can we still have some unemployment although the recruiting cost is zero? So you remember in, uh, in the standard model, and also in the rigid wage model, We had seen that the unemployment, level of unemployment goes to zero when the recruiting cost goes to zero. We had said that, you know, what that means is that all, <coughs> all unemployment is uh, frictional in this model. It's caused by this matching friction. Here, what do we have here in contrast? Well, you can see in the diagram that I've, uh, that I've showed you, here's the unemployment. Oops. Uh, here you, we can see the unemployment is clearly positive. 